Uh, greetings to you all. Today's teaching I've titled, uh, It's Micah, and it's uh, the Redeemer and Savior, Part 3. <clears throat> In Part 1 and 2, we covered um, Yashael's or Israel's sin. Um, we also talked about the uh, the judgment, uh, the, accusate, the court case, uh, the courtroom uh, scene, and we talked about the judgment when uh, Yashael was um, exiled. But all this was amid um, promises of a, of a future much brighter, that even though they went uh, into exile, they'll come back. Um, the God, God was going to save them and rescue them uh, from where they were and uh, re-establish them in the, in the kingdom, uh, in the new kingdom, the millennium kingdom, uh, under his... Um, kingship so yes while whilst they were they were condemned um, or judged and uh, scattered uh, throughout the world um, there were the, the time was coming because the Messiah was going to is coming and he would save them all so yes there is um, crime punishment and salvation so they were told all this in the book of Micah and earlier on we also saw what the um, that they would be rescued and then we now going to focus on um, the uh, the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the promised Messiah, <clears throat> and what he was going to do for Yashael and for the world. Uh, let's just recap here. Uh, we talked about, as I said, we talked about the uh, the punishment and the judgment on Israel, and he says, and the reason why they were judged in Micah 6, um, 14 to 16, part of it is 16 reads, this is because you obey the statutes of King Omri and do all the things that Ahab's family does, um, and you follow their advice and their traditions. So I will let you be destroyed, that's the judgment by the uh, Babylonians, and uh, the people of your city will be laughed at, um, and made fun of by the rest of the world. So the judgment is uh, in Micah 5, um, 7 to 9, uh, where it reads in part 7, Then the people of Jacob who are left alive, the remnant of Jacob, will be will be like the Jew from the Lord uh, among the, the people. Um, and it does not wait for human beings to make, it does not wait for human beings, it does not pause for any person. Uh, those of Jacob's people who are left alive will be scattered among many nations and um, peoples. So Jacob is uh, scattered. now. I just need to clarify or highlight, whilst um, these passages can relate to the coming back from Babylon um, before, yeah, uh, after the 70 years in exile, uh, much of it is very clear that he's talking about a much, f a, a, f a situation much further ahead when he's going to gather them again. Is going because in Babylon he did not gather them. He let some of them who were willing to go back go back. But this time, in that period we are talking about, the age, um, yeah, the period we're talking about, he's going to gather all his people, and he hasn't done that yet. It's something that is still to be fulfilled. And we talked about in uh, in the in part one and two. Micah 2, uh, 12 and 13, and it reads, um, to highlight this point, I will certainly gather you together, people of Jacob, I will surely bring you together from the with the survivors of uh, Israel's decimation. I will gather them like sheep in a fold and like a flock trapped in the center of their pasture. Um, that's the voice translation. The... The Good News translation reads, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the few people left in Israel 
and I will gather them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture, and I will make a lot, and they will make a lot of noise, and there will be so many people in that pen. Yeah, so, so he is going to gather all these people and bring them together. Um, in the ex, in the uh, extended translation, it reads, Yes, the people of Jacob, I will bring, assemble you all uh, together. I will bring together all those left alive in Israel, and I will put them together like a pen, like sheep in a pen, like a flock in his pasture, and the place will be filled with so many people or a noisy crowd. The Amplified Translation reads, And I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob, and I will surely collect the remnant of Israel. And, and again, they are going to be put in a, in a, in a pen, like um, with making a great noise. Um, the Amplified Classical Translation reads, um, in part, They, the fold and the pasture, shall be swarm, shall swarm with men and hum with much noise. Uh, Micah 2.13, uh, continuing with this uh, theme, um, that the Messiah is coming, someone will open the way, go up before them, and the people will break through the gate and leave the city where they, they were held captive. Um, so he is going to break through and let these people who are being held captive out. Uh, that's the expanded translation. And um, it continues, and their king will go out in front of them, um, uh, and the Lord will lead them. The amplified translation says, the breaker, talking about the Messiah, who opens the way shall go up before them, liberating them. So they are a, in bondage like captivity because they are out in the world. They, they are not in their own homeland, uh, which they were promised. Um Yes, as um, as an eternal um, inheritance, and then it continues. The contemporary English translation puts it simply as, um, "I will break down the gate and leave them out. Then I will be their king." Uh, the Dewey translation says, um, "For he shall go up. For he shall go up, and they shall open. Uh, you shall he shall go up." that shall open the way, talking about the Messiah, Messiah uh, before them, and they shall divide and pass through the gate. Now this I take it to mean that we are talking, uh, we're talking about two folds here, the Gentile and the, the Hebrew, they will divide as they, as they go out. And uh, this is also captured in the in the Revelation where he talks about Jerusalem and he talks about the other nations. So they will, they, although they are one fold, they are in two parts. Uh, they will be brought together to make one fold, but they still keep their distinctiveness. Um, the Living Translation reads, and uh, the Messiah will lead them out of exile and bring them through the gates of the cities of captivity. So the, the Hebrew people are going to be liberated by none other than the Messiah himself. So there is no need for to wage a liberation struggle. It will be done for us. And uh, the voice translation reads, um, uh, their leader breaks out first, then all break through the gates and escape. Their king will show the way, and the eternal one will lead them. So that's how they are going to be rescued by the Messiah. Um, as I indicated in part two, we talked about the courtroom scene, and in uh, in God's courtroom, Yashel, God's people, was in the dock, and God is uh, the counsel for the prosecution, or is a prosecutor and judge. And uh, he's also a, a witness, and he has other witnesses. Um, he's the chief witness, and he's got other witnesses, the earth, essentially we could say the all of creation, and also those who hear his case. They are witnesses. They will see the, the, the veracity of his argument and his, and his case uh, clearly. And uh, the God... So God is the prosecutor and judge, and here in this court he justifies and vindicates himself. And um, 
and it would seem that there was God presenting his case. And I think Micah was the other party um, who had the difficult position, it would appear. I'm not, yeah, it would appear he had a difficult case of actually being the prosecutor for the defense. And he found that very difficult. And I don't, um, he ended up actually siding with God. And uh, I'll show you where. Um, in Micah 6, verses 6 to 7, he says, um, this is like now Micah standing in for advancing Yashael's case. And he says, uh, what can I bring with me when I come before the Lord, when I bow before God on high, the exalted God? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? With the, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand male sheep, rams? Will he be pleased with ten thousand rivers of oil? Should I give my first child, um, firstborn for th the evil I have done, my transgressions? Should I give my very own child for my sin? And in Micah 6, uh, 8 answers, and I am not... I, it seems to me, um, not that it makes, it seems to me it's actually Micah answering now, not necessarily in defense, but actually in vindication of, um, the Lord. And he says, the Lord, uh, the Lord has told you, he's saying now, someone is saying the Lord has told you. So it, I think it has to be Micah has told you. This is a classic statement. Uh, um, the Lord has told you, human or man what is good. He has told you what he wants, what the Lord requires from you, and that you do what is right to other people. Be just, love, being kind to others, being merciful and showing loving kindness, and live humbly, uh, obeying your God, or walk humbly with your God. So, uh, that God, so what God really wanted from them was not sacrifices. God was not interested in rituals, but righteousness. And when God says this, um, and then God says this, um, this is what he required uh, to do justly, to live, to love, uh, show mercy, and walk humbly with God. And uh, the, 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 the whole thing, as we started off in part one, is all to do with the sin problem. Uh, sin problem, which we saw in Genesis in 2.17, which reads, um, But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you, uh, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Um, so the crucifixion is the way God found um, as a solution to the problem. Uh, that man had been condemned by this law, immutable law, a uh, law that cannot be changed, that um, the, um, the, the price of sin is death. Uh, Romans 6.23 reads, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of life of God is eternal, uh, life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, so in the, we had an interim arrangement, uh, the law of Moses, and it talks about in Ezra 6.17. And they off, offered sacrifices at the dedication of the house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, um, and, and as a sin offering for all Yashael, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Yashael. In Revelation 3.18, it says, um, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, uh, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here we just fast forward, uh, saying that even in the end times, there'll be a lot of people who are, who are going to be um, who are going to um, to worship the Antichrist or, or Satan. Now in Job, now we, this is the Redeemer Savior section. In Job 19, uh, 25 to 26, it reads, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh 
I will see him. He's talking about the resurrection. That one will be raised from the dead. In John 1, 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the Messiah had arrived. And in Romans 6, 23, we continue with this in the Amplified Translation. It reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, that is his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The classic translation is, for the wages which sin pays is death, but the bountiful free gift of God is eternal life through or in union with Jesus Christ our Lord. The Phillips translation says, sin pays its servants, the wage is death, but God gives to those who serve him his free gift um, serves God gives to those who serve him his free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so now we come to the centerpiece uh, the gospel and it's all about him we are talking about the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem this is Micah 5 2 and 4 and it says but you Bethlehem Ephrata though though you are too small to be among the army groups from uh, the clans of Judah. From you will come one who will rule uh, Israel for me, the Messiah. That is the Messiah. He comes, his or origins, his beginnings are from very old, ancient times, from days long ago. The Lord will give up now. This is what he's saying. The Lord will give up, abandon his people until the one who is having a baby uh, labors, gives birth, then the rest of his relatives will return to the people of Israel. We are talking about the establishment of Israel. It's going to be um, established at a later date. And in the interim, which is the times that we're in, it will appear to Israel as if it has been abandoned. Yeah, it, 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 it will appear that he's abandoned them. They're not in their own homeland. They are scattered among the nations. The the Good News Translation puts it this way. So the Lord will abandon his people to their enemies. Because remember, anyone, God's people are the enemies of the Gentile and will always be persecuted. Um, he will abandon his people to their enemies until the woman who is to give birth has her son. Then those Israelites who are in exile will be reunited with their own people. The Living Translation reads, God will abandon his people to their enemies until she who is to give birth has her son. Then at last his fellow countrymen, the exile remnant of Israel, will be rejoined, will rejoin their brethren in their own land. So we are talking about a futuristic situation here. Okay, we continue with four. Um, um, verse 4 from the expanded translation, it reads, And at that time the ruler of Israel shall stand and take care of his people, uh, shepherd his flock with the Lord's strength, and with the power and majesty of the name of the Lord his God, the Israelites, Yashaelites, uh, shall live in safety, because his greatness will reach all over the earth. So here we are. We are talking about something that is futuristic. It is yet to happen. And that's when the people are going to be gathered and put together when God's greatness reaches all the earth. And when is that going to happen? And that is going to happen in Revelation when he judges the uh, the nations. And um, yeah, he judges the nations and uh, pours out his wrath. Now, the tr message translation reads... Um, but you, Bethlehem, David's country, um, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd, rule Israel. He, he will be no upstart, no pretender. His family tree is ancient and distinguished. Meanwhile, Israel shall be a, uh, shall be in foster ho homes until the birth pangs are over and the child is born. 
uh, here we're not talking about the physical birth, we're talking about his coming. And the scattered brothers come back home to the family of Israel. He will stand tall in his shepherd room by God's strength, centered in the majesty of God uh, revealed. And the people will have a good and safe home for the whole world will hold him in respect, peacemaker of the world. We are talking about his kingdom, uh, the reign, the thousand year reign. It has not yet come. And uh, it is only then that the people, uh, uh, his people are going to be reestablished in their land. So now the Messiah is born. And now what does that mean? So he came to be you, he was born in order to die. And what was happening here? So God said, um, there's a view that says that basically that God is said to rule with both. Well, let's see. One is put this way, that God uh, is said to rule with both hands. Uh, he said that um, he, it says that uh, classically speaking, traditional, uh, traditionally speaking, God um, is viewed to to reign with um, to rule with both hands, the right hand and the left hand. The right hand represents justice, and uh, the left um, mercy. Um, so when we talk about justice, we are talking about you getting your just deserts, uh, what you deserve when you break the law, and mercy is basically your undeserved. Um, um, it's, uh, mercy is just basically something that you get that is undeserved. Uh, so the idea essentially was that the, um, the idea could could not exist without a combination of both, which is justice on the one hand and mercy on the other. Um, yes, um, the rule is that basically one gets uh, uh, what's coming to him. But there is something that is recognized and God is fully aware, is that uh, we humans are uh, basically have many inadequacies, we have many weaknesses, we are susceptible to temptations and fall by them more often than not. We are full of pride and envy, we are rebellious, full of anger and resentment and our faith often falters. We are generally inclined to think we are better at most things than other people, we are this competitive thing uh, and judging other people. Uh, we also but we are all together really imperfect. Um, we are in desperately in need of mercy, otherwise we would all be dead. In Romans 2, 5 verses uh, 12 reads, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, the death through sin, and, uh, and death through sin, okay, um, okay, let me take that again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world, world through one man and death through sin, so death spreads to all men because all have sinned. Um, yeah, we, we fall short of God's uh, uh, glory and we often say that uh, we are nothing but filthy rags before him. In Job 4, 18 reads, even in his heavenly servants, he puts no trust or confidence. His angels um, and his angels he charges with folly and error. And uh, here we know this about the fallen angels. We know about Lucifer. So, yes, um, we all fall short of his glory. Uh, that's why he makes allowances. Uh, he's found a way of making allowances for us. Um, Revelation 12, 21, 17 reads, Then he measured... It was 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. So here, man and angel are, are put in the same category. Okay, now we continue. Ju justice is to give, as I, as I said, uh, to give people what they deserve, but mercy is to give them what they do not deserve. Justice and mercy travel the same road. In um, It is just that justice can only take us so far. Um, justice is complete in itself. Um, but as I indicated earlier, if that were to be applied um, strictly, there would be no flesh alive uh, because we are all 
sinful away as soon as we fall short of God's glory. Um, so this is where mercy comes and takes over, and um, it's actually the way that by, we, by which we are saved. Uh, mercy, the application of mercy. Um, so God is the supreme master of both, that is justice and mercy. God is uh, will always do justly. He will give everybody what they justly deserve. No one will ever be able to say that God is unfair. But thank God, He goes uh, beyond and um, and He beyond justice and gives people what we do not deserve out of sheer love. Mercy and mercy was secured um, through a tragedy. Um, his, his only begotten son who was innocent and righteous and who was put to death instead of us so that we could be saved. The one thing that matters is, um, as far as God is, sees things, as he sees things, is that is how man should stand with God. Um, God is merciful, like we mentioned that, that he wants us to be merciful and loving kind, with loving kindness. And that's the relationship that we have. And the one test is that, is that is um, how we stand with other men. We should be do the same thing as he's done with us. As he is merciful with us, we should be merciful with our fellow brothers and uh, sisters. So, so if you have found God truly and you know him, then you will find yourself acting justly and showing mercy because that's exactly um, how we know him to be. And that is why God looks for that outworking in our relationship horizontally, that the relationship that we have with him vertically. Uh, Makai uh, performs. Now, we talked about his defense for, for Israel. It was pretty poor. Um, but there's something that happened there. He says, okay, he was not able to put up a, a solid, a convincing defense um, case. But anyway, um, he finds himself rejoicing when he learns that God is going to show mercy as well as do justly. Now, mercy is to be pardoned, to be forgiven, and says, who is a pardoning God like you? Forgiveness is a miracle. Mercy is a miracle. Forgiven even though we are guilty, a covenant of mercy. Punishment and mercy is a very difficult balance uh, here, and I think we'll come to that at some point. It's a very difficult uh, balance, uh, to, and to do both um, is very hard, um, and this is a task for, for God. Um, except that uh, an innocent person take, unless of course someone, an innocent take, uh, person takes upon himself, is prepared to suffer the justice on behalf of the guilty, the punishment of the guilty, then God, with the punishment of the innocent, for the sins of the guilty, then God is able to do both. He can punish and pardon at the same time. And that is why the crucifixion was necessary. And at the cross, we see God's perfect justice. The death penalty for sin is exacted. And also at the cross, we see God's perfect mercy, that the guilt can go free because the innocent has paid the price. That is why the cross was necessary. God could not forgive us without the cross, I think. Yeah, um, or in terms of the law as it stands in heaven, you he could not do that without the cross. And in fact, that is why actually he was slain at the foundation of the world. Um, if God forgives us without the cross, he would be merciful but not just. If he refused to forgive and punish us all, he, if he refused to forgive and punished us all, he would be just but he would, wouldn't be merciful. For without the shedding of innocent blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. With the shedding of innocent blood, God can do both. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no justice and mercy, only justice. So we have been positioned because of the blood of Jesus um, and we are taught to act justly and to show mercy as he has done that to us, for us. In Mark 12, uh, 30 to 31, it reads, um, uh, you shall love 
the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So therefore, it is right for us to walk humbly before God, uh, humbly with God, um, following His statutes, His commandments, and loving Him and also loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. And in that way, we are able, will be able to show mercy and love as he we are shown by him so anyway this is the tragedy that we have the cross in a way so we have the tragic story and it's the greatest act of injustice when an innocent man is found guilty of a crime he never committed when he is not afforded no, and he was not afforded an opportunity to defend himself neither did he speak for himself but anyway he he went to the cross quietly um in silence and and but those, but what was worse about this whole thing is that those who are supposed to be judges, um, who have this duty and responsibility to weigh the evidence, saw no evidence pointing to his guilt, but clearly saw the heart and the hand of envy uh, at work um, in the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees. Um, Yes, he saw that, the, that there was no case to answer, but he was intimidated by threats of riots and general unrest and then chose the easier path for him, which was to condemn uh, Jesus, who was innocent, nonetheless such cowardice. Well, it is the worst possible thing that can happen to an innocent person and righteous man. Well, and it is the core of the passion story, because not only is Jesus innocent, he is not merely innocent. He's also good and he's not just good, he's perfect. We know he knew not, he knew not sin. 1 Peter uh, 2, 22 reads, Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Colossians uh, 1, 15 reads, The Son, uh, who is the image of exactly like the visible representation of God, of the invisible God, uh, he ranks higher than everything that has been made. In Romans 8.23 it reads, God knew them before he made the world. Uh, you're talking about his select, his people. Uh, for those whom he foreknew, he chose them. He also predestined, chose beforehand to be, for them to be molded, to the pattern of conformed to the image of his son who is just like him so that Jesus will be the firstborn, the preeminent one, but also indicating others would follow of many brothers and sisters. And Jesus' resurrection confirms that his followers will also share in God's glory as Jesus shares in his father's glory. So here the, we know that God, Jesus was perfect and he died, a perfect man for our sins. And um, this is, he's our savior, our redeemer and our savior. And this is how we come by um, this great gift of our salvation. So Jesus um, was tortured. It was the most terrible torture ever designed. Um, the crucifixion, a terrible torture possible, and it was a terrible way of dying, and was also there to humiliate the person who was dying, and um, it was tragic because it was in the, it was in, uh, it was in the hands of his own fellow men to save to to save him or not to save him, but they had it in their power to say that uh, to, to to have never brought these charges, uh, false charges against him. Uh, but what they motivated them was envy, uh, just like Cain, jealousy. In Genesis 4, 6-7, and uh, the Lord said to Cain, uh, Why are you so angry, and why do you look annoyed? If you do well, believing me and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, 
but ignore my instruction, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you to overpower you, but you are to master it. So anyway, the five uh, Pharisees um, fell into sin when they condemned an innocent man. And the, what is worse is that they actually let the guilty go free. Um, so here we have the, the Messiah, God's anointed, had full knowledge of his death at the hands of the Pharisees uh, who were green with envy and uh, organized the mob comprising of uh, his own people, uh, Jews, Hebrews, who were simultaneously under the thumb of the tyranny of the Pharisees and, 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 and comp uh, Pharisees and uh, their group that includes the Sadducees and all the, uh, all the others, and also um, under the rule of Rome, that in part that uh, that is that was also part and parcel um, of the oppressive system that was persecuting the the Hebrews, and so you decided you to persecute him, Christ the Messiah, knowing that he was innocent. You trumped up charges, not just innocent, but as I said, he was good, but but chose him chose to punish him and kill him instead of punishing the one they knew to be a criminal. So in John 8, 44, it reads, you are just like Je Jesus was talking about this group. He says, you are just like your true father, the devil, and you spend your time pursuing the things your father loves. You, he started out as a killer and he cannot tolerate truth because he's, he is void of anything true. At the core of his character, he's a liar. Everything he speaks originates in these lies because he is the father of lies. That's the voice translation. So many of them went along, the other Jews who were in Jerusalem at the time, and in Israel. Many of them went along with this murderous conspiracy for fear of being ex excommunicated and banished from the temple and participating in religious rituals. Uh, the irony and tragedy of it all is that his people chose to participate and cause the very death of the God of the temple. In Matthew 12, 7, 8 reads, But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And what is also fascinating about the story of uh, the Passion, uh, dying for the salvation of his people, of all people, is that um, the crucifixion is not actually the end of the story. It is. Um, the end of the story is the resurrection. The end of the tragedy is is that there is life after death. And the end of it all is that it's, um, it's a tragedy, yes, but it's also more of the greatest love story of all time. That before, we, whilst we were still sinners, he died for us. So he died for us before we ever professed a corresponding or respondent love while, while we were still sinners, he died for us so that we would have eternal life, um, life if we chose him. Romans 5 um, verses 7 to 9 reads, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone Someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we have, we, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Peter 3.18 reads, For Christ also suffered once for sins, and the just for the unjust. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, 
but made alive in the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Um, Romans 9, 15 reads, And God said to Moses, I shall show mercy, I shall show kindness and mercy to anyone or to whom I want to show kindness or mercy. And I shall show compassion and pity to anyone to whom I want to show compassion and pity. So the uh, mercy, yes, it came as born out of the cross, but it's discretionary. It, it does not fall on anyone um, as a matter of right. It's discretionary. It is applied by the one who's able to do these things. So we have here now, we come to the Christ who has saved us and um, what it means for us. If we get people, so this is basically, we're trying to get into the psychology of, um, of what it means uh, to, to die or to suffer for Christ. Um, martyrdom, this, they, they just talk about martyrdom and general persecution. Uh, the price that we have to pay um, when we follow Christ. If we, you get people to, ex, if you get, or oh, this is, a, yeah, it says, uh, if you get people to expose themselves to what they are terrified of, um, is, um, Is not the end of the story if you get people to to expose them to what they fear the most. And I think the Bible talks about these things and says, what I fear the most uh, um, befell him. Uh, so what was the, the was not the end of the story? The recovering from it is the end of the story. And and it begs this question and to what extent decree are we capable of? of bearing, suffering, and prevailing? And the answer might be to the degree we are capable of confronting what uh, what we fear forthrightly. And that might actually be true in a, in a sense, um, in a way, actually. Um, and we know, and you know, you think, well, how can this be otherwise? In some sense, it is like uh, this. What's, what brings out the best in you is actually when you fear what is the worst possible fear. Yeah, When you fear what you fear most, um, when, you, when it confronts you, it brings out the best in you. So uh, what is most challenging? What, and this challenge, when you face what you fear the most, um, forthrightly, um, it brings out the best in you. And um, and it is it would it will be by this that we can say that uh, we this is necessary, and uh, it will and it will bring out the sacrifices that are required. To put things into alignment, um, and this being confronted by what you fear the most is not by accident. I think that's how the the scriptures um, are designed, um, the kingdom of God. That we, by and large, have to face the thing that we fear most, and one thing that we fear most is death. And when we face death forthrightly. Um, it brings out the best in us is that we overcome death and that this is the the conclusion of it it brings out the best in us when we, we are confronted by what we fear the most now matthew 26 39 reads um then he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying oh my father if it is possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as i will but as you will will and in Luke twenty two forty two reads, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In Matthew um, 27, 46, it reads, um, but 
About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, um, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So something happened there. Um, up to this point, um, he was not talking these words, speak, that was not his speech. Uh, it would, people have interpreted this to mean that when at that critical point, when he had taken all the sins of the world and they were all placed in him like this sacrificial the scapegoat, um, God, his father, turned away because his father cannot look upon sin. So he was now exposed to being without, without be with, not being in the presence of his father. And there was a, but in that in that instant, he overcame what separated him from his uh, father. That is, death died. Sin is death. Death died and released him to the love of his father. So death was killed, died at that point. Right, and in Hebrews uh, 12, um, 1 to 3 reads, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is, is which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and for the joy that was set before him, endured for the joy, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here what we're saying is that he enjoyed, endured pain and suffering and death because he knew something lay ahead and that was of a greater value that's eternal life. So the challenge for the martyrs is not to focus on the immediate, the tyranny of death and suffering, but to look beyond it because that is what is that, that is what you, what what is sought eternal life to be with God in this kingdom. So he says I so the um says and it continues for consider him who endured such was uh, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So he who endured all this is alive, and if you endure it all as well, you also live, you'll be resurrected. Um, <clears throat> Philippians 2 verses 8 to 10 reads, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient, for some say, and he demonstrated obedience to a point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that is, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth. Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23 reads, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, that's God's power, toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name, that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Romans 12, 1 to 3 reads, 
So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embrace what God does for you. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to this world, to this culture, that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he does, what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Right, Re readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So basically he's saying that you are in this world, but you are not of this world and you should uh, separate yourself from this world. You are God's people are in this world, but they, we are not of this world. And so don't get bogged down with all these cultural values that bog us down and keep us looking down instead of looking up, you know, on the, focusing on the material world, which is transient and um, forsaking that which is eternal. Isaiah 50 uh, verses 6 uh, to 8 reads, um, he, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame, shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I set my face like a flint, and I know what I will, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let let him come near me. So, what what he, this is basically saying is that um, he relies on God to go through whatever he has to go, suffering persecution, because his truth and he is life, and he gives life. And in this way, when you follow him and you you have fellowship with him, he is with you. He says, I'm with you until the end of this, um, the end of time. So he will never forsake you. So no matter what you have to endure, just know that he is with you. In Revelation 1, 18, it reads, And I, sorry, and it reads, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and death. So in uh, Isaiah, we saw Christ talking about what he had to endure and how he did it in silence. That's quite, um, that's very quiet. He didn't argue with anybody, but he just set his face like a flint towards his goal, what he had to do, and that was to defeat death. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, from the Phillips translation, it reads, It is sin which gives death its power and it is the law which gives sin its strength. All thanks to God, then, who gives us the victory over these things through our Lord Jesus um, Christ. That's the Phillips translation. The message translation reads, O oh death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening, and, and law called guilt that gave sin its uh, leverage is destructive power. But now, in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, that is sin, guilt, and death, are gone. The gift of our Master Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. That's the message translation. So now, he defeated sin, guilt, and death. He abolished all things. There's no more sin. Salvation is the death of sin, the death of guilt and the end of death. Um, the Amplified Translation reads, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? In Romans 12, 1, which we considered earlier, but I think it's worthwhile going over it again, 
from a number of translations from the amplified translation it reads uh, this is just the um, one not one two three it says i appeal to you therefore brethren and beg of you to view in view of all the mercies of god to make a decisive dedication of your bodies presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice holy devoted consecrated and well-pleasing um, uh, sacrifice to god which is your reasonable rational intelligent service and spiritual worship that's from the amplified translation from the voice translation it reads brothers and sisters in light of all i have shared with you about god's mercies i urge you to offer your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to god a sacred offering that brings him pleasure this is your reasonable essential worship so basically here he's saying trust in your god whatever he tells you to do trust in him put your faith in him depend on him and all is well you will have life whatever it is that he takes you through or takes you over or doesn't take you through what the gift is remains the same he gives you life there is life after death that thing that we fear the most has been conquered in Acts 7, 54 to 60, this is the story of uh, Stephen, okay, after he had preached um, that sermon, uh, sermon that the Jews didn't like, uh, talking about the, uh, the cross and all our uh, historical failings to God, uh, they were very angry with him and then when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, Stopped. Uh, their ears blocked their ears they wouldn't listen to his sermon anymore and they ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witness laid down their clothes at the feet <clears throat> and the witnesses laid, laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul um, yeah this is the one who turns out to be who in the end will become a very remarkable um, uh, apostle of God uh, to the Gentiles. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not judge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Um, that's an instance of a, a martyr. In Daniel 3, 24 to 25, this is where, when the um, the three Hebrew boys were cast into the uh, furnace. Um, and it reads, uh, when um, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. They says, but look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So in all your suffering, in all your persecutions, Christ is, will always be, is always with you. He will not forsake you or let you down. He will not forget you. You are, we are with him. He said, I'll be with you until the end of time. Um, In Colossians 3, 1 to 3, it reads, And then you, then, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sit, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on these things and not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In Hebrews 1, verse 3, it reads, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So we know that um, God, Jesus, is the express image of his Father. And what he seeks to do in this world, in this time, was when it is to mold us into the image of his Son, who is like him. Um, so anyway, having defeated them, um, defeated death, and Hades, Hades, sin, uh, he seated at the right hand of his father. And then Revelation 6, 8 reads, So I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. The power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hung, hung, hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So here he, death, is the fear <clears throat> that we are our f um, the spirit of the creature, the 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 the, the body, uh, this body of flesh and blood is most afraid of. We see this in all animals. Actually, we all fear. They all run away from uh, being killed. They, they all do. We all do. We avoid death. We avoid pain, um, uh, and we certainly don't embrace death. Um, and because of that, that is our greatest fear, and that's what the devil holds over us. Um, and um, and he says that Hades uh, followed with him, so the graves were for these dead people was so were, were with him. And in the Revelation uh, twenty thirteen to fifteen reads, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So Christ the cross defeated death guilt and sin. With this we come to our, our point of meditation. And introspection comes out of Revelation verses uh, 10 9, and verse 9 from the expanded translation and it reads, So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll and he said to me, take the scroll and eat it, symbolizing the internalizing of the word. It will be sour bitter in your stomach, but it will be because it is a message of judgment, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey, because it is God's word and because it brings salvation and vindication to his people. And our benediction comes out of uh, Numbers chapter 7 verses 22 to 27, again from the expanded translation, and it reads, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you should bless the Yashaelites, the sons of Yashael, say to them, May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, may the Lord guard you, may the Lord show you his kindness, and may the Lord make his face shine upon you, and have mercy on you, and may the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you, lift up his face, presence, countenance upon you, and give you peace. So Aaron and the sons will bless the Israel. So Aaron and his sons will bless the Yashaelites with my name and put my name upon the sons, the children of Yashael, and I will bless them. And um, in this way, they are to put my name on the people of Yashael so that I will bless them. Thank you, and may God bless you all.